Good morning, everyone. Appreciate you being here this morning. Thank you, Fred, for those songs. Uh, appreciate Johnny leading that prayer for us. Thank you, Hayden, for reading. Uh, thank you for uh, being here today to spend some time in worship with us. I'm looking forward to that Pack the Pews on September 11th. So please, yes, call friends and family and loved ones and uh, uh, anybody uh, that hasn't been here in a while and just remind them to be there on, on September 11th. We'll try to really uh, get a good uh, a good group in here and sing, sing the rafters out. Uh, I will say about Zay. Man, I miss that guy's voice already. Um, his singing voice and uh, his encouraging voice and I'm looking forward to what he's going to be doing uh, in the future. I know uh, he will be used well uh, in the church down there in Demet. Uh, be a great asset to them. He's been one for us. So let's be uh, thinking about Zay and praying for him, supporting him. Um, the Children's Home, New Mexico Children's Home, uh, the idea is if you've got any kind of books that might work well in their uh, library for the kids, uh, um, please bring those to the church building. Let me know where you put them, and I'll try and get them all together. I'm going to be uh, uh, touching base with Andy Burns, I think probably September 30th, which is a Friday. Maybe the, the, the next day, Saturday, I'll get, get together with him. So if we can try to get all those books here by, I think, September 28th would be the Wednesday before that. That would be a great time to have those ready to, to give to him. Uh, I think uh, Miss Mabel's going to do some puzzles that she's got that would be good for the kids. If you've got maybe some other kinds of ed educational toys or something like that, that you're uh, done with, like to hand on to them, that would be good as well. Um, and then the, the teacher's workshop is on the 24th. Again, if you'd like to talk to me about that, um, maybe we could get a group to go. And our, our uh, meeting in October, the 22nd and 23rd, with Stan Mitchell, uh, I've got some flyers out there. They're green. Uh, I'll try and get other colors if you want them. Uh, but green seems to be one that catches attention pretty well. We can do yellow, orange. Um, but pick up about five of those would be my suggestion. And and uh, put three of them in an envelope with an address on it and send them in the mail to somebody that you think uh, would benefit from that that's in our area. They don't have to be part of our church. They can be a part of any church, uh, any group. Uh, they don't even have to be part of a group. Just send them an invitation if you think that this is something that could benefit them. Uh, if you'd like to, to know more about the content, go on our website. And I've got a little write-up on there, and you can share that on Facebook if you'd like to as well. Good way to get that out. But those other two envelopes, or those other two flyers, uh, you know, decorate your workplace with one of those. Maybe you've got a, a cubicle or an office area. Put one of those up and anytime somebody comes in, they might be able to see that uh, in your workplace. Or maybe decorate your car with it. You could put up on your on your windshield. I see people putting for sale signs in their cars all the time or, or uh, uh, you know, things about things going on at school. Put, put one up about something that's going on at church and that'd be a great way that you can uh, invite people to that event. I know it's going to be good for us. All right, let's dive into our lesson uh, this morning. Uh, the first scripture we're going to go to uh, is in Matthew chapter 7. So you might be turning that direction. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 24 through 27 here just short, shortly. But let me do a little bit of review. Uh, this is basically going to be the last lesson in our series of lessons. Uh, and if you've been keeping count, I think this is number 18. Uh, so I know that covers a long period of time as far as Sundays go. Um, but the idea has been to, to cover uh, 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 some basic topics, some important topics for us uh, so that you know how I feel as your minister, as your preacher, and uh, and you can kind of see uh, some things that I think are important for us to talk about as far as the church goes and how we present our church uh, to this community. Uh, we've spoken about the Bible, about its authority, about God's authority through the Scriptures. We have talked about how to rightly divide the Word of God, to understand the differences between the New Testament and the Old, to see what applies to us and what applied to the children of Israel. We've seen that the most dangerous and destructive uh, force and issue in this world that the world faces is sin. That's what we are up against. And uh, uh, it's not about elections. It's not about uh, wars. It's not about uh, starvation in other countries. It's about the sin that um, uh, pervades this entire world. We know that Jesus was sent to be the solution for that problem, to be uh, the one who gave his life to save us from sin. We spent a lot of time discussing Jesus and his church, uh, how he built it, how he designed it, what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to do, its uniqueness. And I, I try to emphasize that over and over again. The church is unique, and so we have to be unique to be part of the church. We have to be a little bit different, maybe, than others around us. And I don't think that's something that has to scare us. Uh, it's okay to, for us to be different and to emphasize 
emphasize that difference to others in a thoughtful, gentle, helpful way. That church began through fulfillment of prophecy, and it has remained unique throughout time. Jesus gave the church and his, specific, and his people specific names to go by. Uh, God is looking for worship that is done in spirit and in truth, whether it's through prayer, teaching, honoring, celebrating Christ's memorial feast, as we'll do soon, or singing songs as we've been doing this morning. It's all to be done in spirit and truth. God has carefully, but not complexly, organized the church with Jesus as head, elders as guides, deacons as servants, preachers as messengers, and all members active and busy in the work of God. So here comes the so what part. You know, who cares about all that if we don't have a, a charge to take on, something to do with all that information. All this information is useful to a point for anyone, but it is most meaningful to people who realize that sin is tearing their lives apart and they need to do something about it. You can kind of go back in your minds to when we talked about Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 in particular where Peter's preaching to the, proud, to the crowd at Pentecost and he says to them, uh, uh, you know, you have crucified both the, the, the man that is Jesus who is both Lord and Christ. He's the one you've been waiting for. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one and you hung him on a cross and killed him. And they said to him, to, to, to them, what shall we do? That's a very important question for all of us to ask, but it was especially important for them because they were cut to the heart. They knew the importance of that question. What shall we do? Like the people who, who heard Peter's message at Pentecost, you may be wondering, what shall we do? What shall I do in response to all this information? Or maybe something more specific like the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30 who said, what must I do to be saved, more specifically? What must I do? He needed to know. He'd watch this great miraculous thing happen where the, the prison uh, is broken open because of this earthquake that God sent, and all his prisoners are supposedly going to escape. But Paul has said to him, we're all still right here. And he says, man, what shall I do to be saved? How can I, how can I avoid uh, the punishment that comes from sin? It's the most important question you could ask. So how does the Bible answer that question? We're going to talk about that this morning. And, and I know there's just really no way to avoid the idea that in some way this is a process. The process of salvation. The process of being saved. And we, we have a great teaching tool that someone came up with years and years ago where you can just take your hand and use your fingers and say things like, hear. Hear the Word of God. Believe. You can say it with me. It's okay. Hear. Believe. Repent. Confess. Be baptized. Right? And then we kind of have this sixth invisible finger that we kind of come up with later. Be faithful until death. That's okay. We can do that. It's a great teaching tool. But if we allow the process to become merely mechanical... It's just a bunch of gears moving along, and we don't, we don't think about what it means to us, each of those steps, then we've lost the integrity of that process of salvation, okay? So, so let's talk about it this morning. We're going to talk, starting in, in Matthew chapter 7, hear the Word of God. Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 24. It says, everyone, everyone... When, then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a, a, a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall. It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beating against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Great will be our fall if we don't hear the words of God and put them into practice. Do something about them. And that's kind of what we've already said this morning. Do we have to hear the word of God before we can know what to do with it? Absolutely. We've got to hear it. 
uh, what is the point of listening to God and then not doing what He says? Why even spend time listening to God? Why be here today listening to the Word of God if you don't plan to do something with it? It's all for naught if you don't. If we believe He is the Almighty, that He is, uh, that He has a plan for our salvation, then we need to listen well. We talked about this on Wednesday night. If you were there, we need to we need to listen in a specific way. We need to be listening for instructions. We listen differently if we know that there is a test coming. We listen better to our teachers if we know there's a test coming down the, down the pike, don't we? Uh, you guys have already started school, so you know there's tests coming, right? So listen well for the instructions that apply to the test. But we listen differently for instructions, don't we? we? We spend more time, we're more careful about what we hear when we know there's instructions that need to be obeyed involved. So let's do that. In the parable of the sower, I mentioned this Wednesday night, in the parable of the sower, uh, the, the idea of, of hearing and listening and understanding and seeing and perceiving is, is pervasive. The seed in Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 through 23, that's the parable of the sower. You can read it on your own time. But the seed, which is the Word of God, can't take root unless it enters listening hearts. The ones who are seeking it, the ones that are ready to receive it as as it is intended, those are the ones who get benefit from it. So we've got to hear the Word of God, and, and we need to hear it as clearly as possible. Go to Romans chapter 10, please, for a moment. Romans chapter 10. We're going to, as you can see on the screen, there's a bunch of scriptures to go through. We're not going to hit every single one, obviously, but let's go to Romans chapter 10, and you can kind of take some of these down and study them on your own, I pray. And if you have questions about them, we can talk uh, in detail. Romans 10, verse 17. I'm going to back up to verse 14 so you get some context. Romans 10, 14. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Job security for me, right? Preaching. There has to be a preacher. No, that could be anybody. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I hope that all of us have beautiful feet this morning. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. Uh, there has to be a beginning. There has to be this place where we hear, this time when we hear in order to gain faith. Faith is a big deal in all uh, known churches, I would, I would think. Faith. We've got to have faith in something. But, but what is the faith in? How do we know anything about the faith unless we hear the Word of God? How does that faith come to us? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 tells us what faith is, that it's the substance of things that we don't see. It's the evidence of things things that we don't see, the conviction, depending on your translation, of the things we don't see. So we need this, this evidence, we need this understanding to have biblical faith. Faith is the substance, the evidence of things not seen, but we must hear the evidence. Just as in a court of law, the jury would hear the evidence before they sentence someone. They make any kind of, of plans for that person. They've got to hear the evidence. We've got to hear it in order to make conclusions and build our faith. Once we really take the Word of Christ into consideration, it convinces us to believe in something. It's not, uh, it's not Bible hearing. This is Bible hearing we're talking about not just any hearing. It's not Bible hearing if it doesn't convict me and I don't understand it. That's not Bible hearing. Bible hearing is full of conviction and full of understanding. Let's go to number two. Believe. John 8, 24. John 8, 24. What does it say? John 8, 24. I told you that you would die in your sins. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Jesus is talking to a group of people, including Pharisees, who um, are struggling with this idea, I think. But He says, unless you believe, you will die in your sins. Believe specifically that I am He. Who is the He? The Christ, the Son of the living God, what Peter says later on in Matthew 16. So, um, the idea here is, what are the stakes? 
What happens if we don't believe in Christ? Aren't you glad there is an if in that sentence there? Uh, it's contingent. It factors in free will. Free will is still in its place where it needs to be, where we can all use it to make this decision to believe in Him or not. That's one point to make. Let's go to Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. We mentioned Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Verse 6 takes it to another level. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. There's about four or five impossibles in the book of Hebrews. I think this is probably the most important. It, without faith, it's more, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Uh, do you want to please God? I think that's a foundational, most basic question we all need to answer. Do you want to please God? If you believe there's a God, do you want to please Him? You can answer. It's okay. Do you want to please God? I want to please God every day of my life. That's my, my primary motivation. That's my first. That's my top priority. So, do I need faith in order to please God? Yes! I've got to have it. And believing God exists uh, is only the beginning. The fact that He is alive. That's, just, that's, where, that's where it starts. I must also be a seeker, this passage says. I must be convicted, convinced that He has a plan, that there is a reward to the end of this this whole process. John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that who, whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life. We don't even have to go to that passage. You guys know it so well. What is the reward? If we believe in Jesus, we can have eternal life, everlasting life. That means we never die. We'll die physically. <laughs> we all die physically. That's inevitable. That's appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment. But our spirits never cease. Our spirits are here eternally. And so we have to de decide where do we want our spirits to spend eternity, our souls. Can you believe that uh, that was God's purpose in allowing His unique Son to die? Can you believe that? That's His purpose. He wants to send this one and only Son, this unique Son, to die so that we have an opportunity to eternal life. He would never have done that for anything less. That had to be the motivation. No more powerful act of love has ever been done. Uh, if that can't make us believe, if that act of sending Jesus, His only Son, can't make us believe, I don't know what will make us believe. It's not Bible faith. In other words, there's other kinds of faith. But it's not Bible faith. If it doesn't lead me to action, to change my life, that's Bible faith. Let's look at uh, that change. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Jesus says in verse 2. No, I tell you, verse 3 says, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. These people weren't any more sinful than anybody else. Unless you repent, you're all going to face the same struggle. All of us will. Biblical faith involves conviction, and I'm not truly convicted until I'm willing to change. Jesus knows that we can change to avoid punishment, so He doesn't keep us guessing. He says, unless you repent, unless you change, you will perish. John the Baptist said the same thing, but emphasized the other side of it, the reward. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, he says, unless you rep uh, uh, repent, and you will see the, the kingdom of God, right? Uh, an internal change can bring about an eternal reward. Let me say it again. An internal change can bring about an eternal reward. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Wow. Peter says their sins could be blotted out. Peter suggests that repentance is connected with the blotting out, uh, the getting rid of sins. He talks about a time of refreshing in the next verse. Uh, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Uh, it's like taking a shower after working in the dirt all day long. It's refreshing to you. You're cleansed. You don't have that dirt and grime 
time on you anymore. And, and, uh, and, and so you can feel better about yourself, about the day. That refreshing can only come in the presence of the Lord, this passage says. So he pre he's, is He present in our lives? Is He there? He can't be as long as the sin is there. He can't be present in my life if the sin is taking over my life. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 talks about you know, Him not being able to reach out and, and, and get, get to our, our us if the sin is in the way. You can, you can consult that passage and, and, and make fun of my paraphrase. Uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 verse 30. Acts 17, verse 30, Paul's preaching in Athens to those in the Areopagus. He's talking about their, their idol worship. Verse 30, uh, he says, the times, of ignorance God has, uh, God, oh, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. We're no longer in the time of ignorance. We're in the time of knowledge. We have the knowledge available. He's commanded all people everywhere to repent because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed, and of this He has given assurance uh, to all by raising him from the dead. He's talking about Jesus. So who is supposed to repent? All people everywhere. Who does that leave out? No one, right? There's a level playing field for us. The same expectations for everyone. There's fairness in this. Why should we repent? Judgment. Judgment for sin is imminent. It's coming. Uh, it's, it's not different for any of us. Not Some of us are going to be judged differently than others. No. Judgment is coming for all of us. Judgment is, uh, is done by a man who was tempted like us. So again, there's fairness in this. Jesus is, is the one who judges. We can be sure this will happen because the resurrection happened. Because He was raised from the dead, you can be sure that Jesus will judge us. If you don't believe the resurrection occurred, then you won't repent the way that God wants you to. So repentance is a change. A change of heart. A change of mind that results in a changed life. It's not Bible repentance until that change can be seen by others. It has to be an evident change for it to be Bible repentance. Confession. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, please. Don't worry, friends. We'll get there. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. He's fair. Either way. And again, uh, and you may see a different word there. I hope that you do. It, it depends on the translation. Acknowledges or confesses. You can say confessing here. Uh, so, so the idea is, what is, what is the point of changing if no one knows about it? If no one can see it? God God has always wanted His light to be visible. If we don't acknowledge Him openly, His light is not visible in us. We should be proud to associate with Christ. That should be something we're never ashamed of. It's not that difficult to claim Christ in our world today in comparison to other places at other times. Uh, athletes are always claiming Christ after a victory, you know. Oh, because, uh, because the Lord was with us, we won. I have no problem with that. Except that sometimes that athlete's, athlete's life doesn't evidence other kinds of change. So uh, that's not what we're looking for. God is looking for a life confession, not just words. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. That's the key. That's the difference. Romans chapter 10. Let's go back there. Romans chapter 10. Yeah, there's more to, to say uh, that Paul has to say to the Romans about this same topic. Romans chapter 10. Verses 9 and 10. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says, Everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And some people take that way out of context. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
will be saved. But we know there's more to it than just simply calling on the name of the Lord because of Matthew 7, 21. Right? We just said that. Uh, is, confession, is confession linked to salvation? This passage says yes. It is linked. Notice the if again. If we confess, the free will is maintained. Jesus doesn't have to be my Lord, but He can be if I choose Him to. When I choose Him as my Lord, the Lord, word Lord is ruler. When I choose Him as my ruler, then I must serve my Master, my ruler. When confession and belief are from the heart, they authentically motivate salvation. It's not Bible confession until I choose Jesus as the Lord of my life. How do I do that? How do I show that? There's a key thing here in all of this, and it's the big one that we all think about and come to. And we, maybe sometimes we overemphasize, though I don't think we can, but baptism is necessary for salvation. And that's the last, or the next one I want to talk about, and, and uh, I'm going to do it rather quickly because we've done a lesson on baptism recently, and, and we'll probably come back to that topic again. So I'm going to, the, the scriptures are up there. I'm going to go through this quickly. You can look them up on your own time. Baptism, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 says, There is how many baptisms? One, baptism. Acts chapter 22, verse 16 tells us that baptism washes away our sins. Sin's the big problem. Got to get it washed away. I need baptism. 1 Peter 3.21 says unequivocally that baptism saves us. We've got to have it. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Does salvation come before or after baptism? According to that passage, it's after the baptism that we can be saved. Acts 2.38, Peter's forgiveness formula that he gives there to the people that ask the question, what must I do? He said, repent and baptize. So formula is repentance plus baptism equals salvation or forgiveness. Ephesians 5.23, uh, Paul says that Christ is, is the head and he is the savior of the body. I can't be saved by Christ if I'm not part of the body. How do I get into the body? The body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says that we're baptized into the same body. Christ is the head of the body. Does baptism put you in the body? Yes, it does. Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 27. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 both say that we are baptized into Christ. So baptism puts us in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says that all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. So we've got to be in Christ to have those spiritual blessings. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. When, when Philip preached the gospel in that passage, men and women, adults, were baptized. Not babies or children children who can't make those kinds of commitments. Uh, we can talk about that all day long. But adults are baptized. Those who have the ability to, to make that kind of confession, that kind of repentance, that kind of change in belief, and, uh, and can hear that way. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20. Teaching must be uh, done before and after baptism. And we're baptized in the name or under the authority of God's fullness. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All part of that, that process. That they're, they're signing their names to what we do in that process. John 3.20. John baptized in a river because water was plentiful in the river. There has to be a lot of water there. Uh, now, I've, I've seen baptisms in rivers where there wasn't much water, but we found the water. We dug down and avoided the crocodiles while we dug down to get into the water that was underneath so we could baptize people in Africa. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, Jesus is baptized. Uh, and, and because of that baptism, uh, he was baptized in water, uh, and the fullness of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the scriptures were fulfilled in that way. Jesus came up from the water in that passage, so water was there. Uh, he was in the water. Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8, uh, they went down into the water. The passage says in verse 39, uh, they come, came up out of the water, so water is involved. We have to be submerged. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 7, baptism involves a death, a burial, and a resurrection. So, and, and just the word itself, baptism, is um, the meaning is to be immersed to be fully submerged, to be plunged beneath the water so that we have the opportunity for full cleansing of our sins. So again, it can't be Bible baptism if we aren't truly dead to sin, buried in the water, burying our old lives, getting rid of that, and raised by God to walk in newness of life, to walk in the light as He is in the light, to have fellowship with Christ and His followers. It can't be Bible baptism without that. I hope that you can see that none of these items can be accomplished insincerely. I can't be the 
the Christian God wants me to be. I can't go through this process insincerely and actually expect this stuff to work. There's no magic in it without that. I use that term very loosely. None of these actions can have their full effect unless we remain faithful to God until our physical deaths. Romans, or sorry, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 says, Be faithful unto death, and you receive the crown of life. So where do you see yourself today? All the things we've talked about up to this point come to this same question. Where do you see yourself today? Which part of the process of salvation are you in? Where do you need to go next? Don't wait too long to answer those questions. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Paul emphasizes to those Corinthians, today is the day of salvation. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to make this commitment to be a Christian. And the, the process is only mechanical if we allow it to be that way. Instead, I would suggest that the process is a lot more organic than we think it is at first. Uh, there, there is a, a, a series of steps that, that show growth. They show love. They show maturity. They show a, a process of God being more and more evident in our lives and in our hearts. Isn't that something that you want? If there's somebody here this morning who's not yet been baptized into Christ, you, you've heard the word this morning. All you have to do now is, is to, to allow that word to work on you to, to produce faith. You've seen the evidence. Do you believe it? If you can answer that question with a yes, do you believe, then you can make a change. You can make that change evident even today by what you do. And when that change is evident, you can show it to others and you can tell others about it by standing here in front of us and saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when you make that confession, you're taking Him, you're, you're claiming that you want Him to be Lord of your life. And when you step into the waters of baptism, you, you solemnize that. You, become, you make that true. He is the Lord of your life. When you make that commitment in full faith and assurance, then you can walk in newness of life. You can be assured of your salvation if you can maintain it to the point of death. Please, make that happen this morning. If you're ready to, if we can help you in some way, please let us know as we stand and sing. Sing to me when shadows of 